day, grade 10. Welcome back to this physical science lesson. In this lesson, we're going to continue looking at physical and chemical change. So we were talking about inter and intramolecular forces in the last few lessons. So the forces between atoms within the molecules are called chemical bonds. For example, you are ionic and covalent bonds. Within molecules are called intramolecular forces. So if they're inside the molecule, like if they are ionic or covalent, then they are intramolecular forces. Um, forces between the molecules are called intermolecular forces. So intra is within the molecules. So for example, if you've got a water molecule, the water molecule is combined up with, it's got two oxygens and a hydrogen, right? I mean, two hydrogens and an oxygen, right? So the bonds that join the two hydrogens to the oxygen are intramolecular forces. They are the bonds. But the things that keep the water molecules close together when they're in solid phase or liquid phase are intermolecular forces. And examples of your intermolecular forces are your hydrogen bonds, van der Waals forces, and London forces. So yeah, we've got a little picture of typical examples of intermolecular forces. Um, so you've got, yeah, you've got iron dipole forces and grade 10, you don't really need to worry about too much about this because you will be taught this in more detail in grade 11, but it's good for you guys to see. So this is iron dipole forces. You've got hydrogen bonds here. Dipole, dipole, indu iron induced dipole, dipole induced dipole and dispersion forces. So these, these are all different types of your intermolecular forces and you will note that they are between the molecules, not within the molecule. So let's talk some more about the ionic solids. So ionic solids um, are usually solid, ionic substances should I say, are usually solid. They're often in crystal form. So if you think of anything that's crystal, crystallic like your um, your salt structures, everything that is all ionically formed. They've got high melting points and that's because the ionic bonds are very strong. They're also brittle and the reason for this is because they, because of their crystal structure, they break along specific lines. So that's why they tend to be brittle. So if you look over here, you can see these are two examples of ionic substances. This is topaz and this is amethyst. And they are semi-precious semi -precious uh, stones, don't worry about that too much. Um, it just means that they're rare, fairly rare. Okay, but do you see that they're crystalline? Okay, they've got nice little flat facets, okay? Now, this amethyst definitely hasn't been ground into this, okay? This is exactly how it appears in nature. And the reason it's forming this crystalline structure is because it forms a, a network, okay, a crystalline network. In other words, you guys have seen, if you've got sodium and chloride, it forms things like that do like this. So that'll be a block, a block, a block, a block and on every one of these so-called block edges corners and I say so-called because this, the lines don't actually exist it's just where the atoms happen to lie there will be an alternating um, molecule in this case because it's sodium chloride um, so, so in this case okay you can see it forms nice square shapes but it doesn't always form nice square shapes sometimes it can form hexagonal shapes or whatever um pentagonal shapes now the point is that they're also brittle because they break along these face faces and facets okay so that's why they're brittle physical change is a change in the physical properties such as, and we're going to talk about them all, but let's just list them. There's volume, density, temperature, and boiling point and conductivity. So now, these are just examples, typical examples of physical changes. So what they're saying is that if you can see a change in the physical property of a substance, then it has undergone a physical change, whereas it can undergo a chemical change um, by changing the actual molecular structure. So for example, if you've got a block of ice, okay, in a container, 
uh, okay, and it's in a container. And you know for a fact that what happens is when ice melts, okay, now it melts, and here's your container again. It's supposed to be more or less the same size container. I apologize for not being the same size. Then what is going to happen is that water, the, that ice block there, is probably going to.
and I just realized my mic's been muted all this time. So I'm going to have to go through this with you again. I'm so sorry. It's very frustrating when this thing dies. Okay, but before I do that, um, I'm just going to have to make sure that this gets to be a little bit faster. So can you just hold for me a second? Don't go away. Don't go away. Um, <clears throat> what would it be? It's phase of the matter, I think. Yes, yeah. Okay, so, oh gosh, now let me see if I can activate. Okay, I think we're back up live. You can hear me, you can see me, you can see my screen. Life is very good. Um, so I'm feeling a lot happier about this whole thing now. So let's go back here and let me just explain this to you. I didn't, I think I got as far as talking to you about the different, um, see, you can see me, you can hear me. Okay, good. Life is good. Okay, right. So there we go. So if you look at this, you can see that you've got your hydrogen bonding, which I mean, which occurs in your ice. Okay, so what you're seeing here is three phases of your water. You've got ice, you've got liquid, and you've got water vapor. So you will notice that there's no intramolecular bonds broken. The water molecules remain water molecules in all three phases. What is happening, however, is that there's fairly strong hydrogen bonding occurring between these water molecules. And what I mentioned before was that <clears throat> this is actually incorrect by calling it a bonding, okay, it's a misnomer. It is not bonding, it is actually a force, but we call it bonding and it's fine, we get away with it, but it's actually an intermolecular force, um, but it is a fairly strong one. You don't need to know much about that other than that. You learn more about it later. Then you get liquids. Now, liquids also have strong um, hydrogen bonding occurring between their, their molecules, their water molecules. However, because these water molecules have got larger amounts of energy, okay, they can break some of these intermolecular forces and you end up with them being further apart and being able to move around. Water vapor has got huge amounts of energy. It's got a lot of kinetic energy. It's being heated up. And remember the temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy. So um, the hotter it is, obviously the, um, the hotter it is, obviously the greater the average kinetic energy. Um, and, the, and steam is just another way of saying water vapor. If the steam is hot, I mean, if the water vapor is hot, like you've boiled in a kettle, then it's steam. Whereas water vapor is if you've just allowed it to evaporate out. But you can see the difference in the phases. Notice that there's no chemical change. This is a water molecule, that's a water molecule, that's a water molecule. They haven't changed identity. Right, so now I wanted to show you about the movement of particles. And I wanted to talk to you about phase changes. Okay, so what we've got here is some particles and we're just showing you, I don't know, let's show you water molecules since we've used as an example. So this is what the water molecule looks like um, as a solid, okay? It's been held together in more or less crystalline structures. I mean, more or less a hexagonal, one, two, three, four, five, actually pentagonal. Okay, right, now let's heat it up. As we heat it up, Look what happens, okay? You can see that they start getting more energy and as they get more energy, they break that uh, the crystalline structure format and they move around each other, okay? If we heat up some more, 
okay they will start getting huge amounts of kinetic energy and they will start moving away but please note that they remain in their form of water okay they're still water molecules similarly if we cool them okay if we cool them down okay you'll see that they slowly start moving towards each other and eventually they will form their pretty little but please note and this is important that even though they are now in the ice phase in the solid phase they still vibrate on the spot all molecules will continue vibrating even on the solid spot so this is typical um a science joke where they say that you're never quite stationary no matter what because your particles are continuously vibrating okay so anyway so those are your phase changes so if you want to for example look at oxygen that's what it looks like in the solid phase in the liquid phase it's going to look like that and in gas it looks like that okay just out of interest let's go look at neon it's an um, neon is a um, noble gas, so therefore it's going to be very interesting to see what it looks like in a solid. You can see that it just forms a normal solid, liquid, and gas. Same thing the whole time. Right, so what you've noticed, what you should notice, is that solids exhibit vibrational motion only. The particles vibrate, but they remain in place, okay? Particles vibrate, but they're in place. In liquids and gases, much more freedom. They're still vibrating, but now they've got two other motions. They've got translational and rotational. Translational means that they're moving from one side to the next. They're just moving around, zing, 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 zing. And rotational means they're spinning. So solid particles, even if we're talking about a minus 100,000 degrees Celsius, the particles are still vibrating. Okay, and but they remain in place. Whereas liquids and gases, there is more freedom. So it's vibrational, they're still vibrating. It's translational, they're moving from one place to another. And they're rotational, it's spinning around. Okay. Right, chemical change. Now this is different because yeah, new chemicals are formed with new properties. The existing bonds, so we're talking the ionic bonds, the covalent bonds, and possibly the metallic bonds, are broken and new bonds are formed. New bonds are formed, and this is very important. And this is where we start having our chemical reactions, okay? Large amounts of energy are required to break the bonds that hold the reacting molecules together within the molecules. More energy is required for chemical change as compared with physical change, which makes sense because before you were just breaking the intermolecular forces, but now you're breaking the intermolecular forces, which includes your ionic bond, covalent bond, and your metallic bonds. There are two different types of chemical reactions. There's decomposition reactions and synthesis reactions. Okay, so it makes sense that decomposition means we're breaking up and synthesis means that we're making, okay? So let's talk about the two different types of reactions. First of all, there's decomposition reactions. This is when a compound breaks down into two or more new chemicals. So for example, we could have ammonia. No, it won't be ammonia. Let's say we've got water and let's say that we manage to somehow break it up into hydrogen and oxygen. Obviously that doesn't work because we have to balance it. So we need to put a two there and a two there. But you can see that we can actually then break up a water molecule into two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule. Most decomposition reactions require a great deal of energy to break down the original compound into new substances, okay? It's very important that you realize this, that to break something up requires a huge amount, huge amount of initial energy. You might get a lot of energy back out, okay, after it's been broken up, but to actually break it up cause, uses a lot of energy. This energy can be supplied in various forms. The one way is kinetic energy and the other way is heat. Now remember that temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy, 
okay temperatures and measure the average kinetic energy so really by saying kinetic energy or heat we're kind of saying the same thing it doesn't matter whether we're putting a flame underneath it um, or putting it on the stove to heat it up or if we are stirring it to give it lots of kinetic energy the whole point is by increasing the temperature we increase the average kinetic energy similarly if we increase average kinetic energy we are uh, we're increasing the temperature so another way that we can do this is through electrolysis there you go so what you could do is you could pass an electric current through acidified water it breaks it down into hydrogen and oxygen okay so it's one way that we could get out ox hydrogen oxygen from water and actually this is used quite a lot um, specifically in um, cars overseas to make you they use this in their hydrogen fuel cells what they do is they take water in um, and what they, they use they send a current through it they electrolyze it and they get out hydrogen and oxygen the oxygen is released into the atmosphere and the hydrogen is used to fuel the car in other words to make it go um, the nice thing about this is when you burn hydrogen in oxygen it forms water so you go back to giving water off into the atmosphere so that works quite well okay so electrolysis is the passing of electric current through for example certified water and it has to be certified water because of the fact that it needs free ions okay so another example is a decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to form water and oxygen when a catalyst is added so you're taking hydrogen peroxide and it breaks up into water and oxygen so let's watch this little video so here is your hydrogen peroxide now normally it is stable okay it slowly decomposes to form oxygen and water but what they've done is they've added a catalyst of iron 3 nitrate um, to make it occur just a tad faster and that's why this is a bit like orangey red is because of the iron 3 it not only reacts much faster it lets off a lot of heat um, and what is you're seeing there is steam that is being given off there so once the reaction is complete all that's going to be left is the iron 3 dissolved in the water which is why it's that horrible brown color so let's just have a look at that again i'll just play it again um, so they've taken hydrogen peroxide normally it just reacts very slow in the presence of sunlight okay it just needs a little bit of heat but in order to make it happen faster what they've done is they've added a catalyst and Catalyst is iron 3 nitrate, but iron 3 ions are red in color. So when they add this iron 3 nitrate, it gives off the water, okay, in the form of steam because the reaction is very exothermic, it gives off a lot of temperature, a lot of heat, okay. And once it's finished, you'll notice that the water that's left over or the liquid that's left over is going to just be the iron 3 nitrate dissolved in the water okay so there you've got it you've got your hydrogen peroxide breaks down into water and oxygen normally it does a slowly in the sunlight but if you add iron 3 and iron 3 and nitrate is just one of the examples of the catalyst that you can add there are a whole bunch of different catalysts you can add um, but this is the one that's easiest to get your hands on another example that of type of reaction to get is a synthesis reaction so we've spoken about decomposition reactions where we break things up now we're talking about synthesis reaction where we actually make things now synthesis is when you take two reactants two or more reactants and you combine them chemically to produce one product okay now obviously if it takes a lot of energy to break up a compound it makes sense that when you're making a compound that you give off a lot of energy and that's true so for example they call this the oxidation of magnesium but what they're really doing is burning magnesium and oxygen and it forms magnesium oxide now magnesium is a silver gray metal and magnesium oxide is a white gray powder but when the magnesium burns in oxygen, you'll see it now, it forms a bright white light. And this is actually quite cool because if you ever watch any, um, what do you call it, fireworks, 
the different colors are associated with different metals. So for example, Magni, all the bright white, bright, bright, bright white um, fireworks are magnesium. All the green or green and blue are copper based and so on. So um, I think that the purple are iodine, but that's not a metal, but anyway. Okay, so it depends on what they're burning as to what color they're going to get, okay? So now, if we take the magnesium and we react it or burn it in oxygen, you get magnesium oxide. It is a very exothermic reaction. It not only gives off a lot of heat, but it also gives off a lot of light. So even though we had to light this to get it started, the amount of energy that we got out of this reaction was huge compared to the amount of energy that we obviously put in to start it. So let's have a look at this little reaction, shall we? I've done it in the dark just to show you it much easier. Wow, it's bright, okay. It's a little bit fast. Um, okay, so let's just watch it again, shall we? No, I take it back. Okay, right, sorry. Okay, let's watch it. So it is a bit fast, um, basically because to prevent any injury to him and to his students, he's basically pops this uh, magnesium into this Erdemar flask, um, which reduces the amount of oxygen that is reaching the magnesium. And he's probably also used quite a small piece of magnesium. Why? Because magnesium is quite expensive to burn and you can't reclaim it once it's for magnesium oxide. That's it. It's a one-way reaction. Oh, I did it again. So, yeah, you've got the image of what you're going to be seeing. Um, he's made the room dark, so it's easier for you to see it. So there he's lighting it. Yeah, there's quite a short piece. And then he is popping it into the container. So yeah, it is quite a small piece, but basically you can see how bright white it is. So any fireworks that you see that are bright white, it's magnesium that's being burned. So now we need to talk about quantitative aspects of change. Okay, so the reason we need to talk about quantitative aspects of change is that we've actually spoken about chemical reactions, right? We've spoken about the fact that we need to add things together. So we've even basically started it by talking about like two magnesium plus O2 gives you two magnesium O. We actually have already been handling a little bit of the quantitative aspects of chemical change. But now we need to, quantitative means putting numbers to it. So now we've been talking about the fact that things break up and things are put together and energy is required, etc. Now we need to start learning how to put numbers to this stuff. So the first thing that you need to know is that the SI unit for the amount of substance is a mole. Okay. And the mole is a counting unit. So the way I like to explain it to my students is this. Okay. If you've got a dozen eggs, then you know it's 12 eggs, right? If I say to you, how many days, if I say to a week, you know that makes up seven days. If I say to you, um, I want a baker's dozen, you know that's 13. Why is it 13? Because bakers always make an extra roll so they can stick a knife in to see if it's ready. But obviously then they can't sell that bun. So that's why it's baker's dozen. So do you agree that these were all basically collection of some things? So the word represented a collection. So a dozen represents 12. Um, a gross represents 144. A ream of paper is what, 256 pages, I'm not sure. Okay, and the point is that if I say what is a gig, you can tell me the number of bytes, okay? So the point is that it, it's, a, it's a collection. And a mole is basically a collection number as well. It is a, a number that contains 6.02 times by 10 to the 23 elementary particles. Okay, and that is called Avogadro's number. Avogadro established that there were 6.02 times by 10 to the 23 particles in one mole. Okay. And what is exactly is one mole? One mole is defined as the number of elementary particles there are in 12 grams of carbon-12. Okay, and why do they say carbon-12? Because they're isotopes of carbon, right? There's some um, 
atoms of carbon that have got extra protons in their nucleus. So we're talking about carbon-12, which is the most neutral isotope of carbon and so on. We find almost well, everywhere, like 98% of carbon is carbon-12. Okay. If you guys have ever heard of radioactive dating, like um, if they're trying to find out how old something is, like mummies and stuff, they talk about carbon dating. And then they talk about carbon-14. Now, carbon-14 is carbon, but it's got two extra protons in the nucleus, right? And the reason that's important is because then carbon-14 is radioactive and it changes over a period of time. So that's how they can use carbon-14 dating. They just look at how much carbon-14 is in that piece of paper or material or whatever. Now, carbon-12, carbon-12, that is the most stable form of carbon found on Earth. And it's got 12 neutrons, 12 protons, and it's got, actually has it, um, and it's got 12 electrons. I just want to check my periodic table, I'm pretty sure I'm right. 12 protons, 12 neutrons, yes, I'm right. Um, no, it's got six protons, I'm right. Um, yeah, it's got six protons, six neutrons, and 12 electrons. Six protons. I'm going mad. Just a second. Carbon 12. <clears throat> it says the relative atomic mass of carbon is 12, and then it says the atomic number is six. Neutrons have mass, yes. So it's got six neutrons, six protons, and then 12 electrons. Um, but basically what we're saying is the number of um, nucleons, number of nucleons, there you go, number of nucleons is 12. Sorry, my head's a little bit foggy because I'm still sick. Um, so I apologize for <laughs> silly mistake. Okay, right. So carbon-12 is the most common form of carbon in the universe, well, in our universe that we've come across so far. And well, therefore, he, what he did was he based everything on one towards the carbon-12, which happens to be approximately one gram of hydrogen. Not H2, just hydrogen. Okay. So even though we feel that we're comparing everything to one towards the carbon-12, if you look to the periodic table, you'll notice that it starts at one with hydrogen and then everything is respect with respect to hydrogen where carbon happens to be 12. Okay, so what are we saying? We said that Avogadro realized that the number of elementary particles there were in one twelfth of carbon 12, um, one twelfth of carbon 12, yeah is going to be 6.02 times by 10 to the 23 particles and he defined that as a mole as a mole okay right so another way for me to explain this to you which i often say to my students is this if you um if you wanted to um build a mansion and your builder comes along and says, how many bricks am I allowed to buy? And you say, a mole of bricks. How many bricks is he allowed to buy? He is allowed to buy 6.02 times to 10 to the 23 bricks. If you want to win the lottery and the guy says, how much would you like to win? The idea would be to say a mole because a mole is 6.02 times by 10 to the 23. And just in case you don't understand how big that is, let me give you an idea. That is six, zero, two, and then it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, that's how big that number is. It's huge. Okay. So yes, um, if you had to think of this in numbers, it's a thousand million, thousand million, billion, thousand billion, trillion, thousand trillion, six hundred and two thousand trillion particles. If you don't do the American way, the American way would be million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, pentillion, hexillion. Don't do the American way. Okay, so that's how many particles there are. So we said 6.02 times by 10 to the 23 particles. Right, now the molar mass is the mass of one mole 
of the chemical substance, okay? The unit for molar mass is grams per mole, or g per dash dot m moles of negative one. So if you want to calculate the number of moles from mass, we know that the number of moles is going to be the mass divided by the molar mass. Okay, the molar mass. How do, so the molar mass is the mass of one mole, one mole of chemical substance. So in other words, we can get the number of moles if we take the total mass and divide it by the molar mass. So now it says calculate the number of moles of iron, Fe, in an 11.7 gram sample. But the formula is the number of moles is mass divided by molar mass. So the first thing we're going to do is write down the mass. The mass is 11,7 grams. Then we need to go find our molar mass. So you guys need to dig out your periodic tables. And I've said often enough that you guys, if you're watching these lessons or if you are doing science of any type, you should have with you a periodic table, calculator, pen, ruler, pencil, <clears throat> and eraser. So if you go and look for Fe, and Fe is, oh, I can't do it. So Fe's number is 26, okay? Its molar mass is 56. Molar mass is 56. So therefore, the number of moles, the number of moles is going to be 11,7 divided by 50, 56. Sorry, divided by 56, which is going to be what? Okay, 11.7 divided by 56 is 0,2. One. So it's 0,21 moles. Okay, great tens. I think we have to leave it there. Um, we will continue with these lessons on quantitative um, aspects of chemical change and talk about all the calculations we're going to do on Tuesday next week. Have a great day.